welcome you. If I haven't met you before, my name's Christian, and it's my privilege to lead you in worship and praise to our God this morning. So we're going to start our time off singing praises to our God. I invite you to join me to stand, to stand amazed at the goodness of God, at the wonder of our Lord. So whether you're here in the building or watching online, please stand and join us as we sing to our great God. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned. i 
listening and we won't be crying. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place and we won't be quiet. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory.
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God.
into the sky, you spoke the earth into existence, you numbered each of our days, you know the number of hairs on our heads, you love us dearly as your children, Lord thank you today as always for giving us a reason to sing, in the almighty name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. while we all come down. Why don't you take some time to say hello to the people around you. Kids, you can head out to your programs now. Well, good morning, church. Love the fellowship. It's so good. For those of you who don't know me, my name is James. I'm the associate pastor here at Harvey Bay Baptist Church. And it's just so good to be here together. I, uh, this morning, uh, my five-year-old, uh, says to me, Dad, where are you going? I said, well, it's a church day. He's like, oh, you like going to church, don't you? I said, yeah. He's like, that's where you go to see Jesus. And, you know, I didn't go into the deep theology around church, but what I did say was, we can speak to Jesus wherever we are at any time of the week, but there is something special about coming together with the fellowship of believers, and there is joy in the house of the Lord. Joy in the house of the Lord. There's a, a few announcements on today, but if you are new here, we just really want to welcome you here. Go grab a barista made coffee on the house after the service. Uh, go to the new person's table. We just love to connect with you and help you grow here and connect. So, men, on the 2nd of September, 
We have a feed the man meet, all right? Save it in your calendars here at the church starting from five o'clock, 2nd of September. And then I know that Keith is starting to organize a Father's Day service for us men as well, a special thing. Religious instruction, RI. RI has been uh, so critical to sharing the gospel with primary school age students across our nation and our community is so different. But since COVID, the volunteers have been really lacking in it. There's been a big struggle. You know, there's a stat that Julie Terry, our coordinator, told me. She said that there are 500 plus students in our schools in Harvey Bay alone that their parents have said yes to hearing from an RI instructor and we do not have a volunteer. They are not hearing the gospel. And so it is a, a, an amazing ministry opportunity. If this is something that's touching your heart, why don't you go next Saturday, there's an information session, the 5th of August at 10 a.m. at St. John's Church. Just go and have a listen, um, see what they, they're saying and, and see if you can be a part of that. Alpha started last week, and so it's really exciting that we have another, a bunch of people that are going through Alpha, learning more about who God is, how does salvation work. And we just wanted to advertise and say, if there is anyone else who's interested in joining Alpha, it's only a week in, just go to the lobby after the service. We'd love to connect you in there too, okay? All right, so, and after the service today, Karen Young and myself will be behind the sound desk we're, we're doing a life group sign-up. So we here are a, a fairly large regional church, and it is hard to connect deeply with people without this smaller church community inside of it. Some people call them Bible studies. Some call them connect groups. We here call them life groups because we want to do life together. We want to grow in Jesus Christ together. And so if you are not a part of a life group, but you'd love to connect in that way and be a part of a, a, a home church life group, uh, we would love to have you come and have a chat with us. So we'll be down behind the sound desk after the service. Come and see what options we have. We have lots of different options for various people. So I have some, uh, some bittersweet family news now. So Many of you may have known Joe and Chris Richards. They were a part of our church for many, many years. Um, and in the last couple of years, they had to move to Maryborough and move to a Maryborough church as well. Uh, but Chris Richards passed away last week. And so we, we just want to honour him and, um, and thank him for his life of loving Jesus Christ and following him. And we don't know when the memorial... Oh, I don't know when the memorial is, but it is on Facebook if you are interested. You know, Alison? This Tuesday, Tanana Church at 10.30. There you go. I knew someone would know. <laughs> Ross's funerals. Thanks, Eddie. Good church family. We all know somewhere. Yes. Well, we'll be praying for Joe Richards and her family this morning uh, for the loss, but also uh, moving forward with those preparations as well. I also just want to um, just... Just praise God that we have, again, another month of meeting budget with our finances, which is just incredible. Um, it's just such a beautiful change from last year where we were just every month not meeting budget. This year we are. So I, we just praise God for that. And I just thank you for everyone who gives with a cheerful heart. Uh, it is just so important that God wants us to surrender ourselves more and more. And that includes time, money, and energy and serving as well. It's all inclusive. If you are interested in giving, we've got a box just near the lobby. Uh, most people give online these days anyway. All right. How about we turn to prayer? We're also going to pray for Ruth Lay, uh, Ruth and Matt, so one of our missionaries in Canada, and Ruth and her girls have just travelled back to Canada. So we'll pray for them and for the Richard family together. Heavenly Father, we do just want to honour Chris and the life that he lived, Lord. And we just pray that this memorial service will glorify you because of his life and testimony. We just thank you for Joe and the family, Lord. Comfort them, care for them at this time and help them just to process this news. 
We thank you for Ruth and Matt and the commitment they have to obeying you, Lord, and going to the ends of the earth. Lord, we just pray for their ongoing protection. We pray for a Holy Spirit filling and wisdom and discernment as they continue to build your church in Canada. We praise you and thank you for our time together here this morning. We pray for a blessing upon our time and a blessing upon Chris as he gives the message. We thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everybody. If you missed it, my name's Chris. I'm half a senior pastor. Uh, it's good to be here, isn't it? Uh, they're gorgeous days, and it's just great to, to live for Jesus, isn't it, as we've heard this morning. We've come into this term, and we're looking at a series on how God intervenes. We're looking at his sovereignty his control, his power, and we're calling it the But God series. And uh, so far we've seen God in Joseph's life, we've seen God in Jonah's life, we've seen people influencing Joseph's life, but God was putting him into position to save his nation. And then there was Jonah, who's trying to run away, you remember, in the belly of the fish. Uh, but God wanted to save people and so he eventually ended up uh, in the place where he's supposed to be and uh, presenting the message in a whole ginormous city turned to God. That's exciting, isn't it? Today we're looking at the subject, but God protects. And I've chosen a really interesting story from 2 Kings chapter 6. And if you've got your Bibles or if it's up on the screen, you feel free to share with me on this one. I'm going to read it first and then we'll come back and we'll just talk about it as we go through the chapter and see what it's going to say to us about how God protects. I'm reading from the New Living uh, Translation. When the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officers and say, we will mobilise our forces at such and such a place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilise their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God, and time and and again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on the alert in that place. The king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officers together and he wondered, which of you is a traitor? Who's been informing the king of Israel of my plans? Oh, it's not us, my lord, the king said. The, the, one of the officers replied, Elisha, the prophet in Israel, he tells the king of Israel, even the words that you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. Go and find him. Find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the, servant of the, when the servant of the man of God got up early in the morning and went outside, there were the troops, horses and chariots everywhere. He goes, rushed back inside and he goes, oh, sir, what will, what will we do now? Don't be afraid, said Elisha, verse 16. Don't be afraid, Elisha said, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha 
was filled with horses and chariots of fire. As the Aramean army advanced towards him, Elisha prayed, O Lord, please make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Then Elijah went out to them and told them, hey, you've come the wrong way, this isn't the right city, follow me and I'll take you to the man you're looking for. And he led them into the city of Samaria. As soon as they had entered Samaria, Elijah, Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, now open their eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they discovered that they were in the middle of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he shouted to Elisha. He said, my father, should I kill them? Should I kill them? Of course not, Elijah replied. Do we kill prisoners of war? Give them food and drink and send them home again to their master. So the king made a great feast for them and then sent them home to their master. After that, the Aramean raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. Pretty exciting, isn't it? I'm told to keep reading. I'll tell you about that in a minute because the next bit uh, says that Ben-Hadad came to, uh, to uh, besiege Samaria. And I'll explain that in a minute if you just tune in. Let me just explain a few things first. In the Bible, there's two prophets who are, have almost the same name. It's a little confusing sometimes. Elijah, J, and Elisha. Elijah came first and he was the one that apprenticed Elisha and trained him <laughs> and when he finished his life he handed over his authority to Elisha and Elisha went on to be uh, the prophet and uh, these prophets were amazing they did some amazing um, signs and wonders and uh, so Keeping in mind, you've got to get it right, Elijah, Elisha. Today we're talking about Elisha. Now, Elisha succeeded Elijah, who in some ways was considered to be one of the greatest prophets. Elijah, though, when you look at his story, and you can read that in 1 Kings, and coming up into the first chapter in chapter, four, chapter 6, it's an amazing story, but what you find with Elijah, the difference between Elijah and Elisha, is Elijah was not accepted by his king, who was Ahab, and his evil queen, Jezebel. And all the time, Elijah is getting chased around all over the place. Though I want you to read 1 Kings and read the prophet of Elijah, Elijah on the Mount of Mount Carmel. It's my most favourite victory story in Scripture when he met with a whole heap of, of uh, prophets of Baal and they had a competition. Guess who won? It's a great story. You can go back and read that so, during the week. But Ahab, King Ahab, his king was a bad king and his wife uh, Jezebel. But Elisha had a different story. He came under a new king called Jehoram and Jehoram wanted to hear from God. He wanted to have his prophet telling him. In fact, you see that Jehoram just did exactly whatever the prophet told him to do. So that's the situation uh, that Elisha comes in. Now, another little thing that I'd like to explain to you today too is the king of Syria or slash Aram. Depends on your translation as to whether you've got Syria, king of Syria, or king of Aram. Now, they tend to be the same sort of used in the same way but uh, Aram is more like down the bottom end of Syria let's have a look at the map I'm trying to show you this bit can you see that up there and I've chosen a map that uh, has the modern day countries so you can put it in perspective can you see me little red dot there there's Iran, Iraq Kuwait down here, Saudi Arabia Egypt uh, Greece, Turkey, Bulgaria. So that puts it in perspective. We're talking about Syria here and little Israel. Look at it. 
tiny little Israel down here and the area we're talking about today is sort of where that all uh, comes together just at the top of northern Israel and that's the area of Samaria that we're talking about and it's often considered to be just a sort of an area of towns under a king. You might notice as you read scripture here it says the king uh, wanted to know, was, was warring against uh, Israel but down in the next bit it's the king Hadad and he's named and the reason for that I think is that you'll find that that this area of Aram was like a little set of towns where they got together under a king, more like sort of a tribal chieftain, and they used to raid across the border, across the Jordan River, into uh, Syria. Oh, sorry, into Israel. And so there's them, they call them Aram or Syria, but really this group, as you can see at the end of, like, verse 23, the raiders stop going across the border. So it's a, this story is about the little uh, bit of raiding that was going on by those chiefs. And then after verse 23, we get into uh, the big Syria, King Hadad coming and putting siege onto uh, Samaria. So keep that in mind as we just travel through this today. So the king of Aram slash Syria, but and we'll keep calling it Aram because it'll help you to think of them just as that tribal group, a mob of tri- tribes together raiding across the border. Was at war with Israel in verse, in verse 8. As kings do, they confer with their officials and they decide with their strategy where they're going to go and fight. And so he said, we'll mobilise our forces, we'll go up to the hills here, we'll go there, we'll trick the Israelites coming there. And they went to all this strategy. But in verse 4 it says, it tells us, sorry, verse 4, verse 9, but immediately Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not go to near that place, for the Aramaeans are planning to mobilise their troops there. So the king of Aram wanted to take out, or well actually he was just robbing and stealing their stuff and probably their women and sometimes their children and taking them back across the border. So they're at war, but God protects, you see? And through this chapter, we're going to see how God protected, but God protects Israel through intel. Can I use that? That's a good modern word for me to use. Uh, through, uh, um, through a spy network, you might say. But the problem was the spy was God, who knows everything. And so, because God is omnipresent, he's everywhere present, and he's omniscient, and he knows everything, he then communicated with, with Elisha, and then Elisha told the king, don't go to that place, they'll zap you, or words to that effect. He warns the king of Israel where he, he, he could go and where he couldn't go. And that was through Elisha. So God protects Israel through the intel that he, he gave through Elisha. As Elisha informed the king Jehoram of Israel about the war plans of king of, Ar- king of Aram, the king got so frustrated, and you can hear it in the story, can't you? And he claimed that he had a mole in, the, in his organisation. Here's another modern one for you. He said, ah, oh, who's the mole? Or he said a bit more strongly than that. He said, who's, who's uh, involved in treachery and telling our enemy what our plans are? Because in his, his uh, humanness, he could only figure it out from a human perspective. And he said, oh, somebody's got to be telling him. But you heard the uh, reply from the the army officer who said, oh, no, it's not not us. It's not us. We're not doing that. It's this Elisha guy, the prophet. He knows everything, even the secrets in your own bedroom. That was pretty intimate, hey? And... uh, 
they, they convinced King, the king of Aram that that was what's happening. And so, of course, the king of Aram commands his soldiers to go and get Elisha where he is. So get, find out where he is and let's go get him. Wow, that's human, isn't it? Go and get your enemy. Find out where he is and let's get him. <laughs> I'm always amused that he sends out this ginormous army to get one guy. What does that say to you? That tells you he's scared of this bloke. He's really scared of him. And uh, so he sends out that great army to uh, go and get him. And now let me just take another little aside here for a minute and just tell you about prophets and prophecy. There's two things that prophets do aside from their signs and wonders that we saw there. One is foretelling. Prophecy is foretelling, telling what's going to happen. And that's what Elisha was doing here. He was foretelling. And Elijah did that a lot too. Telling the king if they don't behave themselves, if they don't do this, this is what's going to happen. So the foretelling is what we often see as prophecy. But there is also another area of prophecy which we call forth telling and that prophecy is telling what God wants his people to do and it's also praising God praising him and one of my my great examples of that is in the story of Isaiah in chapter 6 one of my favorite worship areas you know which one that is I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and the angels circled round and round, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That was a forth telling, a telling forth of the greatness and the majesty and the wonder of God himself. So in prophecy, you've got those two areas. As a pastor, I'm often doing a, a prophecy in the forth telling and telling you what God has done and what he's doing and helping, helping you to see what he wants us to do as a people. I love the story of when Elisha's servant got up in the morning, Gehazi. Got up in the morning, went outside. You could just imagine him. Oh, whoa! And then he saw all the army just sitting there, all around, surrounding the place. And you can see uh, his reaction to that, which would be our reaction, wouldn't it? Isn't that how we'd react? He looked and he saw this huge army and uh, he rushed back inside to Elisha in a great panic, thinking that his life was about to end. Would you agree with him in that one? Probably if you're in his place, you'd think, that's it. Look at all these guys. What are we going to do? And he goes rushing back in to Elisha and Elisha I can just picture him there sitting there in his lounge chair you know with the scroll before him or something and he goes oh yeah he's not phased at all because Elisha has the tremendous faith in the, the God who is omnipotent has all power and he says to him don't be afraid how often do we hear that in Scripture, by the way? You hear it in the Old Testament. You hear it all the way through to the New Testament with Jesus. One of the first things he says when he turns up, you know, out of the blue, so to speak, he says, what? Don't be afraid. And that is firmly based, the don't be afraid is firmly based on who God is. He's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent he's everywhere present and our trust our faith is firmly locked into who God is so Elisha says don't be afraid for there are more on our side than on theirs you see Elisha as a prophet dealt in spiritual realities he was always talking with God what do we call talking with God by the way prayer he was always in tune with God listening to God he already knew 
that this army was there. He already knew that there was another bigger army around the back of this attacking army. And so he's able to say to his servant, don't be afraid. There's more on our side than on theirs. I think that trust that Elisha was showing, the trust in the face of overwhelming odds, does not come easily to many of us. We tend to panic rather than trust when we get things overwhelming us. And I think what God's saying out of this story today is just remember that when things are overwhelming you, that I am even greater than those things that are overwhelming you. My army is bigger than the army of Satan who's attacking you. You know, we need to recognise that and have a calm faith and a trust like Elisha. It's a call to trust when you cannot see. And that's really a good definition of what faith is, isn't it? Trusting when you cannot see. Sometimes when we have overwhelming odds that are coming down on our life, we need an Elisha. We need somebody praying for us. Because sometimes we can't get there in our own panic. We need others praying for us. And guys, I want to encourage you to pray for one another. You have no idea sometimes how powerful your prayer is in the life you pray, of the people you're praying for. It changes things. Prayer changes things. And I want you to have confidence in that prayer as you talk to God and he tells you there, look, 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 you can see the army Elisha quietly and expectantly prays to God. And he asks him to open his servant's eyes to see the spiritual realities. You know, earlier in the year we were saying we need to expect great things of God, we need to attempt great things for God. But we usually take the comfortable road. But I want to encourage you today to keep thinking about those things, to expect great things from God. God is doing great things. In prayer and in faith, we connect in with God and we can see the spiritual realities around about us. Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes. And so the servant went out and he looked and he saw that physical army of the king of Aram, this overwhelming big uh, warriors and, and chariots. And then he looked up and he saw behind them the whole hillside all the way around was filled with spiritual beings. They looked, they looked like fiery chariots. And guess what happened for a Gehazi when he saw that? Oh. <sighs> he suddenly was able to relax because he could see the potential of God. He could see the potential of God. I'll explain that a little bit in a minute. Gehazi's fears and his panic fell away from him when he saw beyond the physical to the spiritual realities. And guys, this, this is... What it's all about is Christianity. This is what it is with Christ, that we can begin to see the spiritual realities in the spiritual world. Because the spiritual world is the eternal world. Our physical world is here for a time and we're intertwined with that spiritual life, but it's on in our physical life that we get right with God. It's in our time here on earth, in this short 70, 80 years that we live, that we have the opportunity to meet and accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. But we need to look beyond our physical to see the spiritual realities, to see that, that Jesus has conquered death, has conquered sin, has conquered Satan. So we can see that and we can relax because we're safe in the arms 
of our living God. So after Elisha's prayer, the servant's eyes were opened. Keep praying for each other that our eyes are opened. So we can see the legions of angels around about us. I don't have time to preach to you about angels. But uh, sometime we might get that opportunity. But I don't know whether you believe in angels. I'm not talking about what the world thinks. I'm talking about uh, the angels of God. Let me give you just one little thing. Cherub. When you hear the word cherub, what do you think? You think of that little baby on the card. Little chubby, fat baby with little wings. That's not a cherub. Sorry. You want to think cherub? Think about the angel that was placed outside the Garden of Eden with a flaming sword. Big, muscly, powerful being. That's a cherub. And we've got those kind of cherubs looking after us. Isn't that great? So lift up your eyes and see the spiritual realities around about you. And what happened was a very surprising victory. In verses 18 to 20, there is just amazing victory that happens here. In the normal course of events, when you see the angels of God, and you can go back to some of the stories with David and so on, when God acted, the, the enemy army was wiped out. And when that servant went out and he saw all those angels behind him, you would expect in the normal course of a story for the, the king of Aram and all his mob to be wiped out. Wouldn't you? That's what we normally would expect. But that's not what happened. God did something that I don't think we could have anticipated. Elisha prays again. And he prays and he says, Lord, make them blind. Strike strike the enemy blind. And that whole big army of Aram suddenly could not see and then Elisha walks out to that big army and I, I, um, I think God's smiling at this point of time as God struck them the enemy blind they were totally and utterly defeated without one death without one wound Only God could do that, eh? Wow. Amazing. How powerful is our God? And how powerful, friends, is your faith and prayer? You can all be Elisha's in tune with God and expecting great things and attempting great things for him. And so Elisha walks out in powerful faith and prayer. And he tricks the enemy and says, hey, the bloke you're looking for is not here. Let me show you where he is. He was telling a little bit of a fib there because he was there. But where he has taken them, him to, when their eyes opened, they would see that he was there. It's now the turn of the enemy army to be surprised. Elisha leads them in to Samaria. Samaria, there was a big city of Samaria in those olden days and it was the big centre of northern Israel. And you can imagine that city and, and the, the Israeli king as Elisha and probably with Gehazi beside him marching into town with that massive army behind them. I think at first they'd all be going for their weapons But then they saw Elisha. And so they're going, whoop, what's going on here? And so Elisha leads that massive army into town. Have you noticed something missing in the story yet? What did the servant see behind the army? 
What did he see? All those great big angels, the angel army of God. What was their place in this story? I've got one little idea that maybe they were all going along helping the army to find their way because if you're blind, you can't see. Maybe they were involved at that level. But for the matter of this story, I want you to hear today that sometimes God shows us the absolute resource that he has, the potential of his help for you. This massive army represents the fact that God has got power, that he's got overwhelming, victorious power. He doesn't always have to employ it because he struck them blind and brought them in without anyone being killed on either side and without anyone being wounded. That's amazing, isn't it? That's God. We, we laugh when we're reading the story before about when verse 21, when the king of um, Israel saw these guys, what did he want to do? Mate, he was so excited, eh? Here's all the enemy here. Here's all his army around the outside with the enemy inside and he was getting all excited. He said, can we kill him? Can we kill him? Let me at him. And what did, what did Elisha say? He said, no, that's not the way that we behave. We offer mercy and forgiveness. They're our prisoners. And at that stage, that whole army was totally under their control. And even though the king of Israel was keen for vengeance, I've got another but God here for you for protecting, but God protected the enemies. How about that? These enemies that were going to take out Elisha are now here, but God, but God protects them. Isn't that fantastic? And you know, I hear an echo there. Do you, do you hear this echo? The echo of the New Testament? The echo of what Jesus said to us? You hear that? He said, a new commandment I give to you to love one another. And in another place he said, bless those who curse you. For those who, who are looking to do bad to you, do good to them. And that I hear going on here. It's an example in the Old Testament of <coughs> something Jesus teaches in the New Testament. To love your enemies and bless them. That's countercultural today, isn't it? Our culture says vengeance. Doesn't matter what the court says. These guys are guilty. Let's get them. For Christians, we offer forgiveness. And you've seen that in some of the incidents related on TV when terrible things have happened and a Christian family says we forgive them and that's amazing isn't it but only Christians can have the heart and the mind to forgive and so here's the echo of the New Testament here's the direction for us where we are going to treat our enemies with respect and forgiveness we live in a a culture at the moment is greatly changing and some of our politicians, you might feel a great degree of hatred and unkindness towards them, but I want you to pray for them. I want to pray a blessing on them that God would come into their lives and touch them and transform them. God can do that, can't he? He's omnipotent. He's got all power. He's omniscient. He's got all knowledge. He's everywhere present. He can do it. Let's be Elisha's and pray to God for the host of his army to be around Australia and to do great things. He can change our politicians. Do you believe that? It's going to take a fair bit of faith. But he can and he will. Pray. Pray that God changes, that God transforms our nation and that God protects the message of Christ in our culture. So let's just go back over it a little bit. Let me remind you again that victory against overwhelming odds 
comes through calm faith and prayer. Let me say it again. Victory came through calm faith and prayer. When you're in a situation, maybe at work, where things aren't working out well, whether you're in a a marriage relationship and it's going a bit wonky, it seems like it's overwhelming, sit back into your faith and in prayer and get God to change it. Get God to move into it. And maybe if you get your friends to pray for you, they can pray for you that you might see the spiritual things that are going on in this situation. As as your friends pray, you can see those spiritual realities. You can see that angel army all around your situation and you can take a breath. You can relax and you can have faith that God is going to work there. So victory came through calm faith and prayer. Victory came through seeing spiritual realities. Through spiritual realities which easily overcame the overwhelming physical realities. You see that? Just read it through again. You've got to get your head around that. Victory came through spiritual realities which easily overcame overwhelming physical realities. I don't know what's happening in your life at the moment, but I want you to remember this today. When things are becoming overwhelming, lift up your eyes and see the spiritual realities. God loves you. God cares for you. He said he'll never leave you or forsake you. He will be with you. So the question is, can you see the spiritual realities? Sometimes you can't by yourself. Sometimes you need the prayers of your friends. But pray to God. Get your friends to pray for you so that you can look up and see that God is with you and that God is surrounding you, that he's got his arms around you, that his love and his presence are with you. And so that overwhelming uh, physical reality can go down. Maybe it's an adverse medical condition. God can heal it or just remind you we're only here for a short time on this earth and in eternity there will be no more sickness. There will be no more dying. There will be no more crying. As long as as you focus on him. Look up and see that God is with you, surrounding you and loving you with his presence. Can you see the spiritual realities? Lord, open our eyes that we may see you and your protective arm around us. And then finally in verse 23, as Elisha sent off that army back home again, Forgiveness and mercy led to peace. Peace for a time. Those raiders, it said, didn't come across the border anymore because they had been dealt with in forgiveness and mercy and respect. Nobody died, nobody was wounded, but there was a great victory for God that day. God wants to have the victory in your life. Will you trust him? Will you open your eyes and see the spiritual reality of his presence with you? Let's pray. Father God, we have to confess that often we react physically or emotionally to things and panic sets in. But Lord, we we tend to be afraid and and we, we can't think straight. But Lord, we thank you for our friends and for our life groups who pray for us. And Lord, we pray that each one of us, we pray for each other, that our eyes might be open, that we might see Jesus, that we might see the power of the resurrected Christ in our life that overcomes all obstacles in the sense of giving us 
peace that passes all understanding no matter what's happening. Give us the joy of our salvation, Lord. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and look full in his wonderful face so that the things of earth will grow strangely dim as we look on his beautiful face. Lord, we pray this prayer because we believe in you. You are our God and we are your people. We pray in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Is our God.
God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Amen. Well, that brings us to the end of our service today. But please keep the fellowship going, keep the worship going as we head out to a time of fellowship. Grab a coffee, stick around and remind each other of the goodness of God and go well this week.